what I've been doing for several years now. That is, I will record using this. And I'm going to try using um, the lecture capture. The, I literally do nothing for the lecture capture. I put this thing around my head, and at 8 o'clock, it starts recording. And it shuts off automatically at 8.55, and it uploads directly to the D2L shell. So if you're not here in class, and you lose the link to the YouTube thing that I will send you after today, you can go to the D2L homepage for this class, go to videos, and it's already got them space for them all loaded through the entire semester. They're just not populated with actual people, right? And apparently this is supposed to work fairly well for picking up sound. The only problem is if we finish before 8.55 and one of you comes up to say something to me privately and I forget to take this off, yeah, it's recording. Okay? So if that happens, tell me to take this off. Not this, yes. Um, if you're not in class, then you can watch the lectures on your own. I'm not going to try to Zoom the class also. Uh, what else? You're still held accountable for whatever is discussed in class. So if you're not here, because you've got two different venues for watching what happened in class, you're still entirely responsible for that. Obviously, if you are hospitalized or something like that, you know, I'm going to give you uh, an awful lot of leeway, okay? Only 46% of students, MTSU students, and 65% of faculty and staff are vaccinated against COVID. Ask me how I know that. Because the medical slash health director on campus told the faculty senate the other day that and I'm not on the faculty senate, but I asked one of my colleagues who is, I said, how do they know that? Well, it turns out the State Department of Health and the state, state epidemiologist told MTSU the names of everybody. I don't know about you, but there's you know, some privacy issues out there. Anyways, so 46% of you and 65% of us. That's why we're wearing these, okay? If I were God slash president of MTSU, we would probably be remote. And I, I'll just, you know, my own two cents. I'm not worried about COVID, honestly. My daughter's an ICU nurse. She is, whichever, you know, direction you want it, she's way on the other side. Why? Because she's seen a lot of people die from COVID. And she's seeing more and more people in kind of your age group now than before it was, you know, people in their 60s and 70s, they weighed 300 pounds and had diabetes and heart failure and all this other stuff. Now they're seemingly healthy folks, right? Um, so we got to wear these. If you come to class, you're not wearing one, I'll ask you to go get one. I'm not your mama. I'm not going to bring them to class for you. I know People want to see that. Um, secretary right next door has some. Okay? I don't care what kind you wear. You can wear the cheap ones like this. That literally, I just read another article this morning. Are only about ten percent effective. But I and I've got N95 masks in my bag here. But I'll pass out if I wear one of those and try to lecture. Literally, I will pass out because carbon dioxide will build up in those. Right. Sometimes I'll wear a cloth one. I won't tell you why, but sometimes I'll wear a cloth one. Um, so just follow the rules, okay? <clears throat> I'm not the, the mask police. We've been instructed, if somebody doesn't wear a mask, take them outside, talk to them. If they don't put a mask on, if they come back in without a mask, either cancel the class or call MTSU police. I'm not going to call MTSU police, period, for something like that. Okay. Not me. Um, cell phones, off the code stuff. Cell phones, laptops, all that kind of stuff. Okay, you can read that. Don't use them in class unless, unless you've got your books on. And I'll know you have your books on them if you're not sitting there doing this all throughout class, okay, because you're not going to be reading and 
doing that at the same time, all right? Um, if you're a first responder of some sort and you need to have your phone out for emergency reasons, that's fine. Say, one, let me know, and two, just put it on vibrate. Similarly, I don't think I have that in here. First time I do. Similarly, no, I took it off for some reason. If you have an ongoing family kind of medical thing going on, right? Um, first, let me know, like now. If you have, for example, somebody currently in the hospital, and I don't mean, you know, they got a broken leg or something, or, you know, something like that. If it's tentatively life or death, let me know, just shoot me an email and say, Dr. Sherman, I need to have my phone on because, and I'll say, no problem, on just meeting on Viber, okay, or I need to have it out, okay? Um, and even if it's not a reason for having your phone out, but you do have something like that going on, again, just let me know now. Or if it happens between now, you know, and Thanksgiving, let me know within reason immediately. Within reason meaning take care of the emergency first, but within 24 hours, let me know. Why? Well, as with the stuff with the attendance policy, if that happens, I'll bend over backwards, okay? to help you finish this class. If, however, something happens now, this has happened every semester for about the last five years in one class or another. If something happens now or next week and you don't let me know until Thanksgiving, too late. Or you don't let me know for four weeks, too late. Now, it's a lot worse when I have an on-the-ground attendance policy. I don't, so I'm not going to know whether you're here or not. Because as much as, you know, I can see from here up, that's not enough for me to know who you are. I can call your name out and look at your eyes, but if I can't see the rest of you, you're all going to morph together, okay? And I'm really bad about names anyways. I'll recognize, well, I would have if I'd seen your face. I recognize you 20 years from now. I probably, even without the mask, wouldn't know your name by the end of the semester. I'm just really bad on names. Both my parents had Alzheimer's, and I'm, you know, I'm almost positive I've already got it. So, family emergency, let me know immediately. I will extend quiz deadlines if I need to. I will extend exam deadlines if, well, can't the final exam deadline because it's too close to the end. Um, but the first exam deadline, I can't. But you got to let me know pretty soon after it happens, okay? And it doesn't have to be an immediate family member. If it's your roommate, if it's your best friend, somebody. And I can give you examples of every kind of thing that's happened over the last several years. Somebody is diagnosed with cancer. Somebody's dead. I had one student. Last fall, no, two falls ago. Father died like five minutes before class. She came to class in tears. And I was like, cool. And one of the guys in class, you know, helped her get everything together. And, you know, I think actually drove her home if I remember correctly. Okay, so um, classroom decorum, read that on your own, okay? I typically lecture. But I like discussion. I, you know, apparently I'm such a poor teacher. I haven't devised a way to elicit the the right to come up with the right kinds of questions to elicit good discussion. Um, though I have some people say, you know, no, don't go there. Um, don't fall asleep because if you do, and like you're sitting in this chair, I'll come up and do that if your head is on it. I've done it before. 
uh, if you're that tired, just don't come. I mean, there's no attendance policy. Just sleep and watch the lecture later. Okay. Uh, if you have to eat something, just do it quietly. Don't come in and have for breakfast a big old bag of super extra crunchy Doritos or something for the person next to you, you know, flipping out. Um, pretty much all of this is the same with that other one. Okay, back to the real syllabus. Grading skills, real simple. Grading's real simple. Um, do notice the item in bold here. This is new because of the modified attendance policy, right? Usually, if, if you miss a quiz, if you miss five quizzes, no skin off my nose. It, it's going to hurt you. But this is my way of kind of having an attendance policy. Failure to complete or submit three or more quizzes, and there's going to be at least one for every book. So one for Fellowship of the Rings, one for Two Towers, one for Return of the King, one for Sorcerer's Stone, Chamber of Secrets, Estimate, etc. So that's 10, 10 minimum. Um, the last three Harry Potter books, three, four. I'm pretty sure if I just use kind of the template I've, I've done the last year, uh, I think there's at least two quizzes for each of those because I mean, shoot. Order of the Phoenix is like 8,000 pages. You can't have one quiz on that one book, okay? So, failure to submit or complete three or more quizzes and or failure to, there's only two exams, folks. Don't expect to pass the class if you just say, well, you know, I had really good quiz grades and I did great on this first exam, so I'm not going to take the final. You automatically fail, okay? So just don't do that. Um, all I do is I add up the total number of points that you've earned divided by the total number possible. Makes it real simple. That's why I'm an English major and not a math major, okay? So, the schedule, and I should have put beside there, tentative. Fellowship of the Ring will start today, and then all three days next week, okay? Um, notice that means four days for Fellowship of the Ring, but only three for Two Towers and three for Return of the King. Is that because Fellowship of the Ring is the longest? Actually, it is. <laughs> of the three parts of the Lord of the Ring, Lord of the Rings, unless you count all of this material at the back of Return of the King, okay? which we won't talk about. Um, but that's not the reason. It's just because we're going to spend so much time today going over the syllabus and stuff. And I've got to warn you right now. <clears throat> One day you're going to see me try to take a drink with the mask on. I can guarantee it. Okay. Um, what was I going to say? See, often it's Talking about the number of days. Oh, I think this is the first time I have offered this class on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule. I'm used to having about 90 minutes for each lecture slash portion I discuss. Now I have 55 at most, okay? Um, so this might very quickly start sliding this way. If we're still talking about Fellowship of the Ring in two weeks, we're screwed. I'll just say that right now, because that will mean we won't get to Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, okay? I won't let that happen. Um, not sure how I won't let that happen, but uh, if I have to, I can always supplement by sending 
you links to videos of lectures or portions that we run behind on so that you can maybe watch them on your own. Um, I'm, I'm really going to try to not do that. You know, I've got three days, for example, for Chamber of Secrets, three days for Sorcerer's Stone. I usually do Sorcerer's Stone in about a day and a half. But that's on the Tuesday, Thursday, roughly 90 minute schedule. Day and a half does come out to about three weeks. But um, the, the most important stuff with the Sorcerer's Stone is in about the last 40 pages. Most important stuff in the Chamber of Secrets is in about the last 40 pages. Okay? Um, Azkaban, eh, not quite so true. And then you get in the Goblet of Fire and I think it's all important. I think I've only got four days for Oh, I've got five days for Goblet of Fire. That helps. But only six days for the Order of Phoenix. And the book is ungodly long. And really needed a good editor. Okay, any questions so far? Um, I'll probably send out today's Monday. So wait a second. What the? No, I, I said next week we would do fellowship. That's wrong. Fellowship doing today, Wednesday, Friday, Monday of next week. So we'll probably have, if I don't have two quizzes over Fellowship of the Ring, I'll probably put a quiz up next Sunday and make it do either sometime that week or the following Sunday. Uh, the following Sunday would be the 7th. No. 6th is Monday, Labor Day, so the 5th. Um, but before that, before we do the first quiz that will actually count, I'll um, I'll post the sample quiz just so that you have an idea of what to expect, kinds of things to look for. <laughs> I hate these tasks. Um, so that you know it won't hit you blind, and depending on how many we do. We won't do only 10, I know that. Um, probably we'll have at least one drop, possibly more, okay? All right, so I can get rid of that. Close. Will you start around and select more of the book? Mm -hmm. Will it say, like, okay, this is a quiz for your chapter or that sort of page number? Quiz, yeah, quiz, quiz will be, quizzes will be, you know, this covers the first half of the book or this covers through chapter. Okay. Okay. For example, I think, um, like with the latter Lord of uh, Harry Potter novels, beginning with, like, Goblet of Fire, I think what I did in spring First quiz covered like the first, you know, from chapter one through, I don't remember what it was, chapter 12 or 15 or something like that, or page numbers. Okay? Um, sometimes I'll, I'll do both. But it'll never be, you know, hey, there's just a quiz this week. You know, figure it out on your own. Um, now I, I try to be pretty clear about what you're being quizzed over. Okay, anything else? Lights are coming on all the way, except for these, for some reason. <clears throat> so we've got 30 minutes. How many of you have read this before? Notice I said this, not these. It's one book. It's one really long book. Okay? But it is one book. It's not a trilogy. It's often called a trilogy. You'll read about, you know, somebody will write a magazine or a newspaper article or something, and they'll refer to it as a trilogy. No. A trilogy is three 
connected stories, right? Um, one of my other classes, my fantasy lit course, we're doing um, Jonathan Stroud's Bartimaeus trope. Okay, it's three books that deal with this demon named Bartimaeus and this kid named Nathaniel or John Mandrake, as he's also called a little bit later. This is one really long book with one central idea, the destruction of the ring. Tolkien did not originally call it the Lord of the Rings. Called it the War of the Ring. Okay? Um, and it got divided, it got published as three separate volumes because his publisher said, nobody's going to buy this. Unless, you know, you're Russian. Read just about any Russian novel, and they're Dostoevsky, you know, they're all this long, or War and Peace, you know, they're all this long. So his publisher was the one who forced him to divide it into three individual volumes. But you'll notice, if you look carefully, it's divided even more than that. It's divided into six books. Right? Fellowship of the Ring comprises books one and two. Two Towers comprises books three and four. And The Return of the King comprises books five and six. All right? And you can buy it that way now, too. I mean, Harper Collins, this is the golden goose for them. It just keeps making tons of money, okay? And when Tolkien's um, son, Christopher, who is his literary executor when he was still alive, you know, he was putting out one thing after another that his father wrote because he knew there were people who would, who would buy it. Very note, I've got the full 12 volume history of Middle Earth, which is, you know, his notes on the making of et cetera, et cetera. And there's still a ton of stuff, not Lord of the Rings, but a ton of stuff from Tolkien that hasn't been published. In the Bob Lane Library, years ago when I was doing Tolkien research, you know, all of his teaching notes, lecture notes, the whole, it's all there. And people are gradually, you know, publishing it because there's nerds like me who will buy a lot of it. So let me see that show of hands again. How many of you have, have read this? Come on, Leah, don't be shy. One, two, three, four. Five out of roughly 20. It's about what I expect. How many of you have seen the movies? Yeah, there we go. Almost all of the rest of you, okay? Um, little warning. Actually, a huge warning. The movies are not the books. And I don't mean in, in the general sense of, you know, movies or adaptations. Um... The movies are, are very, very different. Peter Jackson uses the Lord of the Rings novel, this, the text, kind of as a jumping off point. That is, he doesn't try to be faithful to what Tolkien wrote. Right? And I'll really try to keep my opinion to myself. No, I won't. I'm just lying to my feet. Um, I think Jackson and his wife, Philippa, I can't remember her last name, thought they were better writers than Tolkien. Um, no offense, but no. They're, they're not even close, okay? Uh, Tolkien was nitpicky when it came to writing. He completed the draft for this in... 1947, thereabouts. First volume wasn't published until 1954. And that's because he kept revising. It started in about 1938, 1939. So, take 39. 39 to 54 is 15 years. It took him 15 years to write this. Part of that is because he kept revising. He kept, you know, he'd have a character and he'd keep going back and modifying that character and adding and correcting, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Have any of you read anything else by Tolkien? Hobbit? Silmarillion? 
Farmer Giles, Pam Smith, Wooten Major, and all those kinds of things. Okay, some of you have. So we've got some diehard Tolkien nerds, and then the rest of you, and that's entirely fine. Um, I want to start with the forward to the second edition, and I really, 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 really strongly recommend. I, think I took it out of. Out of this one. No, I didn't. Item 10 on the um, syllabus under the classroom decorum says come prepared to participate in class. This means that you bring the current book to class, should say each day, you know, tells you I used a previous night course uh, syllabus. Each night, students who come without a book and or means to take notes will be penalized. I'm not going to do that. Uh, I had to do that because one night class that I taught, literally, out of probably 20 students in that class, I think maybe five came with something other than their bodies. And when I say something, I mean like anything other than their bodies. The other 15 literally just walked into class, plopped down. Nothing to write with, nothing to take No, no, just la, 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 la. Okay. So bring the book so you can follow up. The second edition was published in 1965. And you've got a little note in here, note on the text and how to read that. I'm not going to talk much about it. I'm not going to talk at all about it because we are on the Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule. Okay. Um, Tolkien began writing the material that found its way into the Lord of the Rings, or some of the material that found its way into the Lord of the Rings as far back as 1915, when he was 22 years old. Okay. And, and a little bit of background. That was, by the way, when he was um, in France in World War I. Okay. Um, Tolkien was gifted with a language facility. He could pick up languages very easily. By the time he was eight, I, I believe it is, he'd already been taught the, the rudiments of Greek. Uh, he knew Greek and Latin pretty well by the time he was about 15 or 16. Right? He taught himself Gothic, which is the earliest form of the Germanic languages. Right? He learned French. By the time he's writing The Lord of the Rings, I'm, I'm stating this from memory, so I might be wrong because I, I did not even think to look at it this morning. Um, Pretty sure he could read about 15 different languages and he could speak six or seven. And among those languages, including Finnish, Welsh, Bhagavad um, Gita is written in Sanskrit, okay, uh, Hebrew. He worked on the Jerusalem Bible as a translator for. Did partial translations for Job. Um, most of the European languages, I mean, Dutch, all the Germanic languages he knew. Because he was a philologist, that is, a studier of language, okay, for his paid position. So when he talks in the opening part of this forward about how the tale grew in the telling, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, he's talking about this specific tale, all right? But it has its origins back in around 1915, when he he had been reading some old English poetry. Okay, old English is the language spoken in what we today call England, from the period around 600 A.D. to about 1100 A.D. You wouldn't be able to recognize most of it. 
for example, today. Here's part of the Lord's Prayer, for example, in Old English. Fed ure thuthi arton helenu, si finame yahalvo, to becometh in richa ye worthy in wila on erdan, swa swa on helenu. Okay, you can kind of pick out some words, right? Fatter, father. Willa, will. Heavenu, heavenu, you know, things like that. The hall God, hallowed. <clears throat> so Tolkien had been reading some Old English, and he came across this line. In one of what's called an Advent lyric. It's a little poem about the advent, the coming of Christ. And the line reads, Eala Eärendel. Eala Eärendel. And it's, lo, the evening star. Well, yet, somehow, don't ask me how, I don't understand how literary inspiration occurs, because it's never occurred to me, and I'm angry that it hasn't, because I'm not a billionaire like J.K. Rowling, <laughs> um, that sparked something in his mind. And he started playing kind of with it. Well, if you're familiar with Tolkien's corpus, what does this become? Those who've read the Silmarillion, for example. Say it again? Okay, who is a major character He's going to be referred to in this because he's the ancestor of a major character in here. Okay, um, that's that's kind of the foundation point. So Tolkien starts, you know, writing these poems and things, a dictionary of Elvish and Gnomish and all this kind of stuff. And when he begins telling his children in about 1931. The story that would get published in 1937 as The Hobbit, right? Some of those elements find their way into that story. So that when, in 1937, when The Hobbit is published, I mean, it's, it's almost immediately this international bestseller. I mean, kids love it, et cetera, and adults are, oh, this is great, you know, stuff and such. But a lot of people are saying more. More. We want to hear more about the elves, for example. Or we want to hear more about the fall of Gondolin that is kind of very, um, what's the phrase I want? Cryptically referred to. We want to hear more about Gandalf, for example. Well, they had to wait 17 years for this, right? And even, even then, in that 17 years, they got the first part of this. Then they had to wait, it's in the note on the text, it's either six or nine months for the two towers. And then they had to wait a year from the end of the two towers to the third book, right? And if they still wanted more, then they had to wait until after Tolkien died before his son published The Silmarillion and such, right? So he says, you know, the story grew in the telling, and, you know, he says, I talked to friends, Ask them about, you know, should I try to publish this? Second paragraph. When those whose advice and opinion I sought corrected little hope, because he said I had little hope to seeing it published, to no hope. So who were those whose advice and counsel he sought? Anybody know? Then you read Chronicles of Narnia? C.S. Lewis. Tolkien was a member of a literary group called the Inklings. Okay? They met essentially twice a week, once at a pub, once in one of their rooms at Oxford. <clears throat> and they would sit around and drink beer and smoke cigarettes and pipes and read to each other what they were writing. Now, Lewis was one of those who said, no, you, you probably should work on this. He was a great encourager for Tolkien. It was all the other members of, you know, the Inklings who said, not a chance, okay? <clears throat> okay, but what he's talking about in, in, 
in that specific passage is the older tales before this. That's the Silmarillion material. Okay? They said nobody will be interested. Why? Because Tolkien tells us the primary inspiration for those stories was linguistic. He already mentioned he was a language nerd. And he created these stories for one simple reason. What do every languages, all language groups have? And, and by languages and language groups, you know, English, German, French, Spanish, Italian, Chinese, Urdu, Swahili. Keep going. They have a speaker. There's a group of people that speak that language, right? You go back in the history of any language, and what do you see very early on develop? Stories. I don't mean histories. Stories. Myth. Okay? Tolkien was a mythopoeic writer. The opaic that look like anything, it's the word from which we get poem. What's a poem? It's something made. So, in a very crass sense, this is poetic. That's why I said very crass, because it's a hunk of plastic. Right? But it's something made. A poem, today, conventional use, is something made out of words. And we would say, it might have a certain meter, it might have a melody, it might have rhyme, it might have a whole bunch of different things, right? So this is the making of what? Myth. Myth. Now, does myth just seem some, just mean some made-up false story? Not necessarily. There are an awful lot of myths, 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 whatever, that are True, not in the sense that there's really some guy up on a cloud with a thunderbolt who's just waiting for you to screw up. <clears throat> not that kind of thing, right? We're going to hear talk about myths and legends in this. And they're going to talk about character error, for example. They're going to talk about how we walk. He's saying this within the Lord of the Rings. We walk among things that years from now will become myths and legends. We have our own American versions of that, right? The summer of 1787. The summer of 1776. The Constitutional Convention. I don't mean myth that Oh, everything we've learned is all false. No. It's, we look back, you know, in fact, what, get your book. what do we call those men who gathered in Philadelphia? The founders. Okay. But there were people before them. What about the ones who came a lot earlier? But they were founders also. We don't call them founders. They did things, they wrote things that the founders based their documents on. And there were people before the pilgrims. Okay? You can go back to ancient Rome and Greece and such. Right? So, Tolkien says, <clears throat> so I gave up on that earlier stuff. And I worked on this tale. Okay? So he talked about writing during the war. He didn't fight the Second World War. He was too old. His eldest son did. Christopher, he was in the RAF. Right? And then he says on page Roman numeral 23. I don't have time. 855, so 11 minutes. He says, big long paragraph, Lord of the Rings has been read by many people since it finally appeared in print. 
Okay, the second edition was published in 1965. Okay, so 10 years after the first. And I should like to say something here with reference to the many opinions or guesses that I've received or have read concerning the motives and meaning of the tale. Motives, why did I write it? Meaning, what's it mean? Okay. The prime motive, that is the thing that got me to sit in my study and write was the desire of a tale teller. The Hobbit started off as an oral tale he was telling his children. It actually, anybody know how it actually began? The Hobbit. Tolkien was sitting one day, early summer, in his study over his garage, on his house, uh, in his house, grading entrance exams to Oxford. And he had a student's blue book in front of him. I've seen it in, in person. I've worked with some of them. And he's got the student's blue book. And he finishes the last page of an essay. And he turns the page over. And he has his pencil with him because he's been marking the essay. And he writes, literally, out of the blue, in a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. And it's like, dot, dot, dot. It just popped into his head. What was a hobbit? No idea. He'd never heard the word before. It actually does show up in the Old English Dictionary, uh, excuse me, in the Oxford English Dictionary, which Tolkien worked on, he didn't work on the letter H, so he wasn't, he didn't see this part. Um, showed up in the 19th century. Okay? He had no idea. He had no idea what a hobbit was. So he had to figure it out. So he starts writing a story that he then tells to his children every night and reads to the members of the Inklings. And they're like, more dollars, more. Tell us more, you know. So the desire of a tell tale teller to try his hand at a Really long story, because the Hobbit isn't that long. It's a couple hundred pages, okay? That would, one, hold the attention of readers, okay? Lord of the Rings has been a quote-unquote bestseller since its publication. In the 1960s, it was the most widely read novel on, universe, on American University campuses. Students, you know, Berkeley and such, had buttons that said Frodo lives, etc. I'm not a nerd. So, really long story that would hold the attention of readers, amuse them. Yeah, it definitely did. It wouldn't still sell a couple hundred thousand copies a year if it didn't do that. Delight them and at times maybe excite or deeply move them, right? He says, so how did I know what to do in order to achieve these things? What did I like? You know, writers will tell new writers or budding writers, write what you know about. Write what you live. And this was Tolkien's world in terms of his Scholarly interest, he was a great scholar of Beowulf, Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, all the Middle English literature, Gotham. I mean, it's what he it's what his mind inhabited, even though his body was in 1930s, 40s, 50s, Oxford. Okay? So he says, I I had myself as a guide. I wrote what I would have liked to read. Some who have read the book, comma, or at any rate have reviewed it, comma. What does that clause mean? Or at any rate have reviewed it. It happens all the time. They didn't actually read it before they wrote reviews of it. You can, you can tell if there's a book, for example, that you really like, and you've read it cover to cover numerous times, and you can find 
reviews of that book and go, it's clear this person has not read the book. Okay? That's what Tolkien's talking about. But notice, he's being gentlemanly. He's being discreet. Okay? They found it boring, absurd, or contemptible. Now, there's a huge difference between boring and contemptible. Contemptible means what? To be damned. I mean, probably, I'm being conservative. 50% of you are bored out of your minds right now. I would be surprised if that same 50% would say, he deserves to be damned because I'm bored. I mean, there might be, I don't know, 5, 10, 40% of you that would say that. So, Tolkien says, cool. That's fine. Guess what? I have similar opinions of your works. You don't like what I write? Fine. I don't like what you write. Have any of you read Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451? If you haven't, it ought to be required reading of every university student. For the simple damn reason that we are living in the midst of it right now. Okay. Bradbury writes, wrote, 1984, I think it was, a coda for the end of Fahrenheit 451. Because we're going to go, Fahrenheit 451, ostensibly, most say, oh, it's all about censorship. It, according to Bradbury, it's not, actually. According to Bradbury, it's about the dangers of technology. Censorship is just part of it, okay? But word got to him that his publishers had over the years, from its publication in 1953, 51, had been silencing, silently removing the dams and hells from the book. Anybody have just a wild guess why? Because it was taught in high school. Can't, can't have her little virginal ear high schoolers hearing reading the word damn you know that was one problem and the other one was he got letters from a variety of people but he mentioned specifically a student group at a university who wanted to put a play put on a play of the book but they wanted to add some female characters some some strong women characters and he was like Read the damn thing. Write your own play. If you want to play with strong female characters, write that play. Don't take my book and change it. Right? For those of you, for those of you whose only experience of Lord of the Rings is the film, get prepared for a big shock with the character of Arwen. Arwen Evenstar, a.k.a. Liv Tyler, okay? <clears throat> I'm not going to say anything else, just let that hang out there. I know we've only got a couple more, a couple more minutes, okay? So, he goes on and says, as for any inner meaning or message, that is, what is its central thing? What does Tolkien want everybody to walk away from the Lord of the Rings thinking about life, the universe, and reality and stuff? You know? It has in the intention of the author none. That is, I did not sit down as a conservative slash anarchist Catholic. Okay. Conservative holding to the old traditions, anarchist, thinking the government and pretty much all social systems are corrupt, pretty much describes Tolkien, Catholic. He was a guide-in-the-wool Catholic. He believed Catholic doctrine 100%. Right? He says, I did not sit down and try to sneak my Catholic belief system into people's minds. C.S. Lewis did try to sneak his Christian ideas. He has a, an essay where he talked about, you know, 
I read reviews of one of my novels, and I realized the reading public there are idiots. He doesn't, my words, not his. He says, and I realized I could use romance, not sex romance, but belief in the fantastic and the mysterious and such. I could use romance to sneak in Christian theology. That's after he read reviews of Out of the Silent Planet. And then he wrote Paralandra, which is packed with all kinds of Christian. So, i got to stop because it just cut off, I think. Tolkien says, yep, it, had, it is neither allegorical nor topical. Okay, We'll talk about that. We'll pick up there, whatever it is, Wednesday. And we'll go a lot quicker. Well, I shouldn't lie. We won't go a lot quicker.